Hello, welcome to this IFG live event asking where next for special advisors. I'm Alex Thomas. I'm a programme director at the Institute for Government. And until last year, I was a civil servant working with more special advisors than I care to remember, obviously, always entirely harmoniously. Um, British political commentators uh, create this uh, sort of foundational myth and have an ongoing fascination with the uh, the Svengalis and the shadowy figure, figures supporting ministers. Um, uh, lots of governments are reported as having some dark force at their heart, leading a prime minister astray. Um, Harold Wilson uh, had Marcia Williams, Lady Falconer. Um, Thatcher had Alan Walters and the civil servants, uh, Bernard Ingham and uh, Charles Pohl. Um, uh, Blair had Alastair Campbell, of course, um, and Theresa May, Fiona Hill and Nick Timothy. But um, surely no advisor has created quite as much comment, quite as much uh, fascination uh, as uh, Dominic Cummings. And now, just like that, he's gone. So what next? Uh, Boris Johnson has appointed an ex-civil servant as his chief of staff, and not just an ex-civil servant, an ex-treasury civil servant. Um, what does that mean for the future of special advisors? So it's the perfect time to ask where next for SPADs, and to look at whether the people who live in the dark are as mysterious as all that, or whether they're just highly stressed men and women trying to do their best for their political um, bosses who are doing an impossible job. So we've got a very special panel to talk about this uh, incredibly timely subject. Uh, Peter Cardwell um, is a former special advisor to four Conservative cabinet ministers and the author of The Secret Life of Special Advisors, out now in all good bookshops. Uh, Salma Shah, who is a former special advisor to Sajid Javid, and she's asked me to say, no, not that one. Um, John McTernan, uh, who is a former political secretary to Tony Blair, worked in number 10 for a long time and uh, uh, has uh, worked in governments across the world. And our own Tim Durrant, who is an associate director at the Institute for Government and recently published uh, a paper on special advisors. So I'm going to start with you, uh, Peter. You were in government uh, until February this year. You saw the Theresa May transition into uh, the Johnson government. Uh, how did the Johnson government uh, differ uh, in the way that special advisors do their um, work? And do you think we're now at a point where it's going to revert back uh, now we've got a new chief of staff? Peter. It was totally different. Alex, first of all, thank you to you and the Institute for Government uh, for having me along to this. Uh, totally different night and day. Um, I remember standing at the back of a meeting in number 10 where Dominic Cummings had just said, if you leak, you will be marched from your desk, uh, your phone will be taken from you, your laptop will be taken from you, you have no rights. Um, and I thought sort of for people working, you know, 14, 16, 18 hours a day uh, for the government, it was maybe a little bit too much stick and not enough carrot. I remember turning to a friend of mine, uh, a fellow special advisor at the time and saying, you know, we're, we're, we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, it was very, very different. The whole relationship between uh, ministers and their spads really since the rule has existed now for 56 years when Harold Wilson brought it in in 1964 uh, with that speech to uh, Chogham, the Commonwealth Heads of Government in, in, uh, in Jamaica, I think. Um, he was um, it was envisaged as something entirely different. There were periods, of course, during that time when there were very few special advisors. Now I think there are more than ever. I think there's something like about 110. Um, and certainly Dominic Cummings, uh, I mean, we can be as critical as him, uh, of him as you want to be, and I'm sure many people will be during this call, but actually in the 56 years of the rule, I think he's probably the most successful uh, special advisor. He's done, he has three things uh, to his legacy. One was a, a huge conservative majority that I'm not sure would have happened uh, in the same way without him. The other one is Brexit, which you may disagree with, but he of course doesn't, uh, thinks it's a wonderful thing and uh, some civil service reform as well that um, would not have happened without him. So there are many cabinet ministers who have periods of office that are less than the sort of 18, 19 months, not even 18 months that Dominic, 16 months that Dominic was in government. So, um, I mean, he has three three things to his name. But uh, the answer is night and day. I mean, the, the relationship between Downing Street and special advisors, uh, even the way I lost my own job, for example, was when Downing Street withdrew its approval. That's happened before. Uh, you mentioned Fiona Hill there, it happened with her when Downing Street withdrew its approval. Mrs May didn't want to sack her when she got sacked from the Home Office, but that's what happened. Uh, but that happened a lot more uh, with Downing Street, a lot more uh, sort of granular um, uh, uh, sort of uh, control 
and also imposing spads, which I don't know, maybe perhaps John can tell us a bit about whether that happened in the Blair and Brown administrations. I, I can't remember it happening, but of course I wasn't there. But um, it was, you know, there have been a number of times when Dominic Cummings has, has or and Lee Kane as well, have kind of imposed people specifically with cabinet ministers um, to, to almost keep an eye on them. So very, very different. Um, I think the relationship has changed dramatically and uh, how it will uh, change under Dan Rosenfield or perhaps go back as it has ever so slightly already under Eddie Lister um, will, remains to be seen. Do you, do you think it will go back? It, I think it has already. I think, you know, Eddie's already said to, to people that, um, you know, after the reshuffle, they can really have whoever they want, um, particularly, uh, obviously, through Downing Street, we'll need to be happy, but the level of control will be will be much less. Uh, but and it, it sort of depended whether you were, you know, close to the vote leave people and close to Dom as well. I mean, my my co spat at the Ministry of Justice, for example, very, very close personal relationship with, with Dom and would get, you know, WhatsApps from him at all hours of the day and night, asking him all sorts of constitutional and legal issues, uh, questions and so on. So, uh, whereas I, I received very, very little uh, from number 10, apart from uh, the press always saying we're happy with the job you're doing until of course they they clearly weren't so um it's uh, it's i think it, i think it will revert I, I think downing street appears to me from what i can pick up from friends who still work there appears to be a calmer place but also what's interesting uh, in terms of the the tumult over the last few weeks uh, a lot of people I've spoken to on the inside say that it just didn't feel as tumultuous inside uh, that it did outside. It felt that oh, there was a very small number of people who were very, uh, of course, angry and dislike one another and so on. But the briefing outside was sort of amplified. Uh, obviously, when you say something to the press, it's amplified to a huge degree. So, um, and it was such a small number of people. I mean, there was a, a fairly high ranking uh, spad in number 10 I was chatting to uh, on Sunday who was telling me that, I mean, he, he, he sort of, wasn't involved at all uh, and said that, you know, he was he learned more from the papers than he did from the people who worked, you know, um, 20 feet away from him. So um, it, it's a sort of very interesting uh, atmosphere in terms of how things look versus how things were. Um, and and that, what that I think will calm down um, significantly in coming days. Certainly is. Thanks, Peter. And we'll come back to lots of those uh, lots of those themes. Uh, I should have said at the beginning, uh, do uh, use the Q&A function. Keep your questions coming in. Uh, I'll rattle through as many of those in the uh, later part of this event uh, as I can. But we'll turn now to uh, Selma. Uh, do you think special advisors are there because uh, ministers don't get the support they need from the civil service or from elsewhere? Are they are they filling a gap? Um, uh, should there be changes in the way that, that ministers are, are supported? What do they really do? I think depending on you know who the minister is and the context of of um you know where the minister is uh, sort of performing i think spads can have a very very important function as long as they're really really clear from their minister how they fit in so it really is it could be about filling a gap but the gap is in the minister's uh, knowledge and understanding the primary function I was thought for a special advisor was having the political sense and the political eye on staff. So I'm sure we'll we'll go into kind of like the new appointment in the, of the chief of staff in number 10. But critically, you know, the civil service is not supposed to think in the way that you think. And if you do too much in terms of trying to um, emulate, you know, civil service thinking, you're not actually doing your job as a special advisor. Uh, what you have to be much more mindful of are things like um, relationships in Parliament and how you're going to sell something to certain outlets and newspapers and how are things going to go down in Tory associations and how are things going to go down with voters. So you need to always have that campaign mentality um, as a core function of what the special advisor does. Now, part of what you do is also thinking about how you're going to shape and bend policy. Um, and that might be because of, um, you know, an ideological objective as opposed to a particular policy objective. And it's about having that creative conflict and creative tension um, in the department that serves your minister's purposes, whether it be, um, you know, strictly political, or whether it be, um, you know, a, an ideological um, battle that you might be having with the civil service. Um, but it, it is more governed by what the minister requires, I think, your job. And that's the interesting thing about the Dominic Cummings era, and to some extent the Nick and Fee era in number 10, which is it was governed by them and what they were thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the dangerous crossover happens. It's sort of who are you working to and whose agenda are you working to? Because your minister has the constitutional responsibility that's given to them by the prime minister. And so, you know, technically speaking, you know, what your minister wants is what the government wants because of the uh, because of the representation of that. 
Um, so the fact that, you know, you have, you know, as Peter just alluded to, you have sort of the, the senior person, senior staffer in number 10, being the person that is driving the special advisors. Mm -hmm. That is not how it's supposed to work. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not a good way of working either because that cross cutting is undercutting a very complicated process. Now, did I find it frustrating? Yes, I absolutely did. Did mm -hmm. I hate having to kind of go back to civil servants every so often and you know say that actually, no, we don't want it like this. We want it like this for mm -hmm. this reason. Yeah, of course that's completely frustrating. But you have to have those lines of those clear lines of communication, however blurred they sometimes become, because these are really big, complex organizations. And if you have that cross cutting of kind of like special advisors just picking up the phone to special advisors, whereas sometimes it can be helpful, actually that being the main channel of communication means that everybody else who needs to do the job is cut out. And if they are cut out, it leads to ineffective government, regardless of what you think of civil servants. And, you know, I'm sure the civil servant colleagues that I work with will have some choice things to say about me, undoubtedly. But, um, yeah, that's that's where I that's where I think the function of the special advisor and where it goes wrong in terms of being able to make the system work actually has kind of become a little bit difficult. I can't believe any civil servant would have choice words about special advisor, <laughs> least of all you. So, um, uh, but no, that's really, really, um, uh, really insightful. Thank you. Because there's the, the, the in my experience, the best civil civil uh, the best special advisors were those who could um sort of knew uh, knew their minister's mind and amplify it rather than having a sort of rival base um john uh, uh we'll pick up on lots of these points but i want to particularly ask you about the difference between being a number 10 special advisor and being a departmental special advisor because they're quite different mm -hmm. things in one you're part of a, a big a big political team in another you're um, working with one or two other colleagues um, in a department supporting your secretary of state what, what what do you think the number 10 team role is in supporting special advisors and what are some of the differences there so I had the, the role as political secretary of trying to strategically draw together. Uh, well, I, I gave that to myself, but I took the role of strategically drawing together the advisors. And I took the opposite view um, from uh, from Dominic Cummings, which is, you know, you, you know, either, should, should you be respected or should you be feared? I chose to be respected, not feared. Um, and what I did was I gave people access to each other and access to information that was otherwise scarce. So I I had weekly briefings on the Friday when the boss was away, when the ministers were away, they came, the advisors came to number 10. I showed them the polling. I shared the focus groups with them. So they actually got information that otherwise they wouldn't get from the party, wouldn't get from the center, uh, gave them uh, a place they could talk every, 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 every week one advisor could present on their policy area. So basically, what three-part meeting, you get something which is, uh, you wouldn't otherwise have the, the polling, you get something from each other, from somebody else in this part, give you a sense of the, the broad thing. Then I told them what they had to think, what the line was, what the kind of strategy was, we're going in that direction. Um, and I then, from the center, I did the opposite in a way of, uh, of, what, of what Peter was just describing. I didn't have the attitude that advisors had no rights. Um, I twice prevented the civil service sacking um, advisor, female advisors who were on maternity leave because uh, they believed that um, uh, the fact were prerogative appointed meant that there were no rights. Turns out Harriet Harman's uh, rights for women at work came over the top of the crown prerogative, which I was very pleased to do. So I was the shop, I was the shop steward. I also did, I, I gave the line, the hard line, according to McTernan and the centre, and I took the view, you can just as an advisor in a department, you cannot police the department. There's too many officials. Uh, you can't from the center police. Uh, and the the other spads who were, because I was actually a political appointment, I was a political secretary employee of the Labour Party. The other advisors who had policy specialisms in number 10 had to work very closely with uh, with their oppos. So health service uh, under Labour for the first time ever was not done by the health service, was not done by ministers even, it was done by um, Simon Stevens as advisor in number 10 and Paul Corrigan as advisor for John Reid. So you so you, you, you did have some very powerful agendas cutting across there, um, but in the end you have to decide, in my view, you do not have all the time to run everything and I think uh, when he reflects back on it, Don will see that you can't actually run the world from the centre what you have to do is set a strategic direction 
that people can subscribe to themselves. Of course, you can always beat people into submission and pull them uh, into that. But the question is, you know, uh, how last how how lasting is that effect? Because um, uh, we we don't live uh, in a Maoist country; we live in a democracy. So you don't, you can't execute one of educate a thousand. You have to you have to lead by some form uh, of embodying the kind of leadership you want to see around so the political leadership. And I think the thing I'd, I'd add to the to what, what Salma and, and Peter said, the really important point is we bring a party mentality into the heart of government. The strategic decision historically in Britain has not been to politicize the civil service. It's been to bring in political civil servants who are called special advisors, who are who are appointed um, by patronage quite and and we, if we take this the issue that was raised, uh, did I ever force a, uh, an advisor on a minister? No, in fact, I actually actively didn't block people uh, who I thought weren't up to being advisors, because in the end, if a minister appoints a bad advisor, they'll get bad advice, they'll hurt their career. Um, so cho choose a comfort blanket advisor if you want, but you'll suffer the consequences of it. And, and some people did. Um, but you, 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 have, you have to take uh, a very strategic view of what can you influence. And I'll, I'll finish on this point. It's a Jonathan Powell point. Jonathan always used to say there's three types of work. When he was as chief of staff, he said there's the type of work that only I can do, and that was Northern Ireland security and defence. Uh, the second type of work is the type of work which other special advisors in number 10 do, and he could collaborate with and improve it. And the third type of work was the work other people did, which he would collaborate with and could ruin it. And great leadership is understanding what is yours, what you can improve, and what you should step away from because other people are much better at you uh, at it than you are. Yeah, thanks, John. And that, that points at ministerial level as well to a sort of uh, style in this this government that has uh, uh, that that may or may not be about to change. And <clears throat> excuse me, I'm picking up on that um, that point, uh, uh, Tim. Uh, what do you think the? Um, it, it does seem to me we're at a moment. Uh, now, with the Cummings departure and the Rosenfield uh, uh, coming in as chief of staff, what are the what are the opportunities there for the prime minister um, if he wants to make this reset work? Um, uh, uh, what what should he do with his special advisor team now? Thanks, Alex. Yeah, as you said, it, you know, people are talking a lot about this being the sort of the big reset of the of the Johnson Premiership. So it'd be interesting to see how that actually plays out in the new year. I think, to my mind, there are there are two main main things. One is back in summer of last year when when the um, leadership election was going on. Everyone was talking about the kind of prime minister that they thought Boris Johnson would be. And there was a lot of talk about him sort of taking the model from City Hall, where he was sort of, you know, quite hands off, sort of devolved power, you know, had very capable people who he trusted and allowed them to get on with things. And he was very much kind of figurehead. And and actually, that's it's, it's kind of, you know, the story has been almost the opposite of that, where every it seems every week or every day, there's a story about number 10 is going to take control of this. The prime minister is taking personal charge of issue A, B and C. And, and that's partly just the kind of political gravity of number 10, right? Because if there's a negative headline on an issue, then number 10 needs to feels the need to try and sort it out. So so issues always do get pulled to the centre. Um, but I think that's also partly, you know, the style of the advisors that the prime minister's had around him. And so it will be interesting to see if with a new chief of staff, there is more of that kind of devolution out and, and empowerment of individual cabinet ministers and their departments and their advisors. Um, and the second, change that I think we might see. Um, I was reflecting on what Peter said about um, about Dominic Cummings kind of three big successes, the Conservative majority, Brexit and civil service reform. And actually the first two of those, those are campaigning successes rather than governance successes. And actually civil service reform, really, it's been a bit of a campaign too. There hasn't been that much actual on the ground implementation of that reform yet. So yes, I completely agree, big successes, uh, winning the argument, but actually will this government is, is, is January 21, the time that Boris Johnson finally sort of transitions fully from campaigning to governing because he's, you know, we're, we're moving into sort of steady state of this government with, with a new team in number 10. I think that will be, I think that's a real opportunity and I, I think it, it is a possible, quite a significant change of tone for this government. It'll be interesting to see how that goes. Tim, sorry to interrupt you, but I think you'll find in the 2019 election it was actually Jeremy Corbyn who won the argument. I don't know if you. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's steer away from that one, Peter. We can have that debate another, another time. I mean, I was going to pick up there on um, on that point that, that Tim just made. I, I'm 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 not going to hang around. I'm going to dive straight into questions because there are lots um, coming uh, through. Um, but James Dowling uh, uh, picked up on 
uh, your point, Peter, about um, uh, uh, Dominic Cummings being the most uh, successful SPAD. Um, uh, James says, what, what did he achieve on civil service reform specifically beyond firing some perm sex somewhat randomly? Um, so there's a question there about what, I mean, it, it speaks to Tim's point about campaigning and governing, but maybe what, what can a special advisor achieve in, in, in government, whether it's number 10 or in a, in a department? Peter. I think James Donning probably has a, a reasonable point there on uh, civil service. We both uh, know James as a former, uh, if it's the same James Darling, where we were uh, special advisors <laughs> in, uh, in, in mm -hmm. the Ministry of Justice and worked with the brilliant uh, permanent secretary, Sir Richard Heaton, uh, who sadly uh, did not last uh, under, under Dominic's reign. In terms of what a special advisor can achieve, I mean, my philosophy has always been, uh, despite the fact of being, you know, uh, rather shamelessly plugging my book um, in, in, in recent weeks, as, as some people may have noticed. Um, but I mean, it's not about you. And, and actually, the, you know, you've got to remember it's about the minister you work for. It's about, uh, you know, making them uh, bigger in the media, pushing their policies forward, getting the relationships with number 10 correctly. And the two things that all SPADs must must have, and if they don't have them, and they were alluded to earlier by, by Alex, actually, and a little bit by John and Salma as well, where uh, the two things that all SPADs must have, and if they don't have them, they may as well not be there, is connection to number 10 in the Treasury uh, to get things done and to push things through, um, and know the mind of their minister. You know, when civil service co ser servants come to you and say, what will he or she say about this, think about this. And that takes time as well. I mean, I was, um, I was, uh, you know, uh, I was working for James Bruggenshire, for example. I worked for four different people, but the person I worked for mostly was James Bruggenshire. It took a while to get to know his mind. It took a while to understand how he would react to things and how he would view things, um, especially sort of random bits and pieces of, of media things that would pop up and so on. But in terms of being a special advisor, it should be how well you reflect the person you uh, work with, how well you uh, drive their agenda forward, how many battles you went with the Treasury to get things done, um, how many battles or, or, or collaborations you, you have with the Treasury or number 10 in terms of getting things done. I mean, I, I, ironically, actually, despite the um, what, uh, what we've been talking about in terms of number 10 under Dominic Cummings, I actually work far more effectively uh, with our number 10 policy lead, uh, a great guy called Blair Gibbs, who's now in Canada, who was the uh, now left number 10 and lives in Canada, who was Home Affairs and Justice. And I mean, I got on really well with him. We, you know, a lot of things were, went forward because uh, my co spad uh, Dr. Rajiv Shah and myself and Blair work very, very closely on a number of things, especially in regard to uh, terrorism legislation. So it's, it's knowing, it's relationships, really. It's relationships with your, your other spads. I mean, I always thought um, that, you know, Sheridan West, like the, the kind of, peace be upon him, the kind of uh, great, uh, great uh, dean of spads, the only person I think, um, spad or minister, I'm pretty sure I'm right in this, who has lasted the full 10 years of, uh, continuously anyway, of the uh, Conservative, obviously, coalition first, but Conservative period of office, um, holds these sort of drinks at the end of the week. And I always thought that, Far better to go to the drinks, have a chat with fellow spads, and then when you pick up a call, I pick up the phone on three thirty on a Tuesday afternoon to have a really difficult conversation with someone at Defra or you know the, the Welsh office or whatever. You actually had a had a relationship with them, and it was those interpersonal relationships that that got things done and that unblocked things. And the civil service often looked to you to to do things they can't do to have those kind of co uh, conversations. And um, if you help your minister implement what they want to implement if they retain their job or if they are promoted or thought of well or have a good legacy um you know that's what that's what a spad needs to do especially stra strategy as well is a huge thing i mean i i there's one particular secretary of state at the moment with with whom i'm familiar who's um thinks he's going to be sacked in uh, in the reshuffle who's who's say, saying what's my legacy at the moment i mean that, that is absolutely the wrong time uh, you've got to from day one you've got to say i probably have 18 months to two years maybe not as long as that um, what, what do I need to achieve by month three? What do I need to achieve by month six? Uh, what are the one or one or two things that I'm going to be remembered for that people are going to, to remember before? And actually, one of the best examples of this is actually Salma's boss, Sajid Javid at uh, DCMS, who uh, broadband rollout, for example, a load of MPs love the fact that he really cared about that and pushed that through. And that was something that um, that he, he really you know spent a lot of time and effort on. Um, and that was something that made him more popular in the eyes of many MPs. So, you know, it, you can have one or two things. We're talking about Dominic Cummings having three um, that you will achieve. And the special advisor's job is to identify those, tell the department. Um, I mean, we, we actually, with James Brook and Sharon Housing, we literally produced an A4, one side of A4, and said, these are the Secretary of State's priorities. Everything else, by definition, isn't a priority. We're doing that. 
everything else doesn't really matter unless it's it's an issue that comes up and has to be dealt with. And um, so I think you need to be that ruthless because the civil service will continue to fill up the red box every day. They'll give the Secretary of State plenty of work to do. It's up to the political team to decide what are the priorities and what are we going to do uh, over, the, over the, the, the very, very short period of time that you are uh, in any department usually. Mm. Always uh, easy to say and hard to do the priorities. Yes. You uh, get to the get to the list. Thanks for that, um, Peter. There are a number of questions and it's a, a, a very long standing debate about special advisor numbers. Um, so uh, uh, Dan and someone I'll come to you with this, but Dan says, should there be more spans across across Whitehall rather than two or three departments? Should there be more political appointments in general across the civil service? Um, uh, uh, Louis Coiffe, I think I hope I pronounced your name right, uh, uh, Louis, does the classic pairing of a policy and a press SPAD still make mm -hmm. the most sense or should we have different arrangements in, in departments? For those who don't know, there is does tend to be one special advisor who leads on communications and another who focuses on uh, on policy. And, uh, and Mary asks if uh, special advisors should uh, receive better support and uh, training. So do we need more better special advisors? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, <laughs> is the <laughs> easy answer to that. Um, so let, let, let me take those individual um, questions. Yes, numbers absolutely have to increase. And, you know, there's always that fight about the number of special advisors and what the cost is to the taxpayer. Actually, you know, you're getting a pretty good deal for special advisors, given the salary caps and everything else that are in place for them. Um, because I remember uh, pretty much working 18 hours a day, seven days a week for about five years. Um, I took my job incredibly seriously and I uh, felt that I was on top of it all the time and having, uh, you know, some more people who were political um, mm. would actually not just help um, the minister, but would help the civil service. And, you know, Peter talks about the red box being filled. I, I never thought of that as something that the civil service were doing because they wanted to avoid priorities. I felt that that was always something that the civil service did because there's a lot of work in government. There is a hell of a lot of work and people need stuff signed off. And I re distinctly remember, um, you know, the box was closing at like 6 p.m. and at about 4.30, I'd just come back from maternity leave and about 4.30, somebody sends up a 200 page document <laughs> on brownfield sites that needed to be reviewed before it went into the box. And I just thought, I'm, 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 A, I'm not up to speed with this policy. Um, and B, you know, that's really not my specialism. If you think as the civil servant and the private secretary that that is fine to go to the minister, then fine, put that in. Um, but, you know, a couple of extra expert advisors, you know, with a, or, or political advisors with with that on their mind and that being, you know, front front of their mind, in front of their expertise would have been helpful. Um, so absolutely yes on numbers. Um, and as I just to reiterate, not because it's about the politics versus the civil servant, it's about making that work better. Um, the policy and press divide. Um, so I think that is a sensible way of dividing it because um, in any corporate organisation, you would have uh, internal functions and external functions, um, but it represents essentially the same work. And I think the way that I think policy and press is perceived is that press is the sort of, um, you know, younger, uglier sister of policy. Um, and I, and I cer certainly think that Whitehall officials do not understand the importance of communications and that whether a policy lives or dies is dependent on whether you can sell it. Um, so I think that that divide is correct because there are, they are two very different skill sets, but I think the importance um, of each of them is equal. Um, and I think that people, the, the, the misunderstanding is that um, that press is about, or policy is about backfilling what you need for the press. Actually, quite often it's about, OK, we need to do this really difficult thing over here. And how are we going to manage that externally? And that is everything from stakeholders to media to, um, you know, voters to MPs to, you know, across Whitehall. That is your external function. So I think if it's understood in that sense, it actually works better. Um, and then um, upskilling. 
without a doubt, special advisors need uh, upskilling. And I think it's really interesting, just to go back to John's earlier point, is, you know, how he talked about having that Friday meeting and, you know, giving people that cup of tea and, you know, sharing with them the polling. Actually, you need to help special advisors feel empowered and make them feel like, actually, there is a bigger mission here. So it's, it's not about what you are achieving as an individual it's about what you're achieving for your minister what you're doing for the government and what you're doing for the mission because most political special advisors have a, a well i'd like to think anyway a much bigger purpose um outside of just their own sort of um gratification and sort of um, profile um they want to do things that are good and want to make things better so upskilling them uh, in terms of teaching them, you know, how is the right, the right round process working? Um, you know, how are you supposed to work with your civil servants? What is the function of the PPS? So when, when there is kind of pushback from the civil service that you'll be able, you're able to distinguish what is actually really good pushback, which quite often makes better policy because, you know, the civil servants have seen this all before. They've probably tried to, you know, create that policy that you're really pushing for that think, you think is a great genius idea of yours. Uh, that actually has been done 20 times before. So, you know, understanding how that system works, how that culture functions, where it's come from, I think is massively beneficial to special advisors, and that's the kind of skills they need. I think the, the role of private office is sometimes mm. overlooked in this. It's absolutely central as a kind of bridging point and relationship um, point uh, and to help to help special advisors and ministers um, uh, understand what's going on. Uh, John, I could see you nodding away at uh, lots of that. Do you want to come in on any of those points? A couple of things, really. One is um, on the comms point. You know, I've been a policy person and a comms person and a political management person and a chief of staff. And my entire experience teaches me the problem is never the communications. The problem is always the substance. The, the, the one of the assumptions that everybody makes in every organization, public and private, is they come to the comms people and say, can you comms this? And the answer is we can't comms it if it's really rubbish. Nobody could, could nobody could comms the poll tax. Um, that was not a communications problem. And when I people say it's a, it's a communications problem, they never mean that. They mean it's a substance problem. Um, because unless your behaviours align with what, with what your, your words, then th that doesn't work. And look, I, I, the great genius idea point was a really good one of Sal Salmas. I mean, universal credit is a classic, a classic example of something which has been looked at and abandoned because it is too stupid to do. And we're now in the middle of an idea that's too stupid to try to do being done. And it's being done to the poorest people in society. We looked at it um, uh, in the early in the early Blair years, then Alistair Darling looked at it. Um, and the, the the obvious, you know, it's either generous or it's brutal. And it's never gonna be generous because of treasury. So it's brutal and that's the world we live in. So we, we do have a world where things have been seen before, but I, I thought, the, fun, the, thing that, the point that you made, Alex, which I think is probably my single greatest point of learning from uh, my time as special advisor is we never in 13 years of Blair government worked out exactly how well we could and should use private office. I think that's the un, like the, the best relationships are SPAD to minister, SPAD to permsec, SPAD to PP. And each of those are separate and they're confidential from each other. Because you, there are things you do with the PPS the Prime Secretary should never know about. There's loads of stuff you do your minister should never, never, ever know about. Um, and there's things that other people in the department tell you the Prime Secretary should never know that you knew from other people in the department. That, but that, but the 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 capacity of the private office to be the engine. And there, are, there are no successful advisors in my in, in my experience who view the civil service and enemies, and there's no successful ones who don't work out how to work with the private office. But I would say, you know, you, you can see the quality of the people uh, who you worked with because, you know, um, well, people, my colleagues worked with Dan Rosenfield. Um, uh, I worked with Tom Scholar, I worked with Jeremy Haywood when he was uh, in the PM's office. And, you know, you work with people in the, in the private office who are going, so, who, who are going somewhere and you're going somewhere too. And the, the, key, the key to the advisor thing is to align uh, the capacity of government to the imagination of the party and the minister and to your, your, your job, which isn't to get uh, into the papers, your 
to get your minister into the papers, but your job is to be the liaison, the kind of thing that you can move between all these different things. Nobody else can move between the party and the unions um, and the, the perm sex and the cabinet secretary if necessary and numbered. It's that it's the ability to move around, um, but to but to co but to hold on to a, 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 what Salma said, a, a sense of purpose. You are there for you are there for a purpose, and it's it's not a highfalutin one. It's simply that you think that parties have a role in politics and they have a role in creating ideas, generating future leaders, in advancing debates, uh, in, in, in making government better because the failing of all governments in the end, civil servants, advisors, ministers, is, you know that point in a government when you know it's over is when you hear a minister saying on the state programme, you guys don't understand how hard it is to be in government. Um, it's when it's when you resort to it being a technical exercise. It's never a technical exercise. Um, and, and once it becomes for you a technical exercise, that's the time that you need to start appearing on IFG um, podcasts and IFG <laughs> seminars rather than actually working uh, in government. Marvellous. That's the, and the, I guess one of the tensions is it, for the civil service often it is a technical exercise and the uh, genius of a special advisor is to bridge the politics mm. with the technical and then be able to sell the, the, the technical side. Um, Tim, let's talk about accountability. Um, uh, Dave <laughs> Penman has asked a question about uh, ah. whether, uh, whether you uh, think that a consequence of the Cummings uh, uh, happenings have been to dilute ministerial accountability for special advisors, both in the eyes of the public and the press, and how important that responsibility is with the ministerial code. But I want to broaden that a little bit as well to talk a bit about um, how, you know, in the, in the dark or in the light special advisors, should they be appearing in front of select committees? Should they be being held accountable on their own terms uh, uh, if they have the power of a Dominic Cummings? Or do they work far better in the dark? We're getting excellent head shakes from uh, Summer and uh, John. So, Tim, give, give, the, uh, give, give, give your take. Sure, I will. But just I wanted to just say really quickly two things from the previous section. So one on numbers is that actually if you look at the setup of government now, the real preference of ministers is that they do want more SPAD. So officially everyone other than the prime minister is only allowed two. I think there are sort of eight or ten ministers who've got upwards of three or four. So, you know, people find workarounds um, and or they employ uh, policy advisors that are directly recruited to work in the minister's office or, you know, that there are sort of very various kind of different um, slightly uh, uh, sort of unofficial ways of bringing more support directly into ministerial uh, setups. And just on that, that final point about the technical exercise, I think, as you say, Alex, you know, civil servants see government as a technical exercise and they like a SPAD who can understand that side of it. So I, I was a, an official, very junior official at the Treasury when Neil O'Brien was a SPAD, he's now an MP, he was a SPAD to George Osborne. And he was one of the Treasury officials' favourite SPADs because he really cared about the detail. He would come and sort of join our team meetings and get into the kind of evidence and discussion. And, and you know, he was involved all the way through so that when he was advising the Chancellor on something that I had written, he knew the backstory, he knew sort of where it was going and then could bring that kind of political lens on top of it. So that's that's a really helpful angle for a, a SPAD to take. Important, important preparation for uh, coronavirus Twitter threads as well. Yeah, absolutely. You can you see know, his 20 tweet threads. Um, but on accountability, yes, I think uh, the, the Cummings model is, is interesting and, uh, you know, clearly there are certain SPADs, Cummings was one of them, but uh, David Frost is another, and then we have these people, uh, sort of Dido Harding, uh, Kate Bingham, who are not civil servants in the traditional sense, they're not ministers, they're not SPADs, these kind of government appointees who have huge sort of oversight responsibility yeah. for big government priorities that are not uh, subject to the kind of normal accountability that a civil servant would be or that a minister would be in terms of answering questions from parliament. So I think there is there is a gap that has opened up under this government. Uh, and I think uh, to answer Dave's question specifically, yes, um, that, that it does risk diluting the ministerial code. The issue that the ministerial code always has is that ultimately it's the, the prime minister is the arbiter of it. So if the prime minister decides that someone uh, whether, you know, if the Prime Minister's view is that this person doesn't need to be sort of disciplined for something that seemingly goes against the ministerial code, then that's entirely his prerogative. So I think there's there's a, a bigger question about the, the status of the ministerial code and whether that kind of 
enforcement angle of it needs to be taken away from ministers because it will ultimately always come down to a political decision in the current sector. Um, on advisors being held uh, more to account individually and appearing before select committees, I'm sure everyone else will say no, uh, which I completely understand. But I think if you are going to have people, uh, you know, individual inv advisors empowered to sort of direct key aspects of government policy, take decisions in a way that, for example, I think David Frost is doing as, as chief negotiator with the EU, then yes, absolutely, they should appear before Parliament. You know, Parliament is is how the government is held to account. And um, I mean, Lord Frost has appeared before select committees in, in both houses, and I think that's that's a good model. I don't think it makes sense for all special advisors. You know, 90% of special advisors are working behind the scenes doing all of this liaison work that John was talking about with, you know, inside government and with key people outside government. They're not telling government what to do they're not making decisions but for if if we are moving towards a world where there are more of these individual high profile empowered advisors who are almost quasi ministers then then yes they should i i think they should face the same sort of scrutiny as as elected ministers so it depends on the role but i i want to i want some disagreement i want a heated debate now so salma do you want to come yeah, in yeah i was just going to say look the, the problem with sort of accepting this as the thin end of the wedge and actually let process this and have people more accountable to parliament is that it totally undermines the function of the special advisor i mean you've just heard john say that there are certain things that your minister should not know that you do there are certain things that you should uh, certain conversations that should not sort of overlap with each other and you're supposed to be that little hub that exists you know, to, to be able to manage these things and make things run smoothly. You are not supposed to exist. Um, so, you know, trying to move this into a direction where, you know, we accept, OK, there are high profile spads and therefore we should, you know, cast them in this um, quasi ministerial role. I think it's totally the wrong way to do it. I think actually we need to sort of repel this idea that this is something we should accept it absolutely isn't something that we should accept it's not constitutionally correct and i think if you believe in anything as i do as a tory and maybe john you you would agree with me on this is that it's not establishment and it's not wrong to believe that certain processes and systems are there for a reason and that you should respect and protect them and the special advisor um not being seen as totally influential is one of those things mm. Thanks, Salma. Uh, John, you wanted to come in and then Peter. Um, yeah, so. Just, yeah, go on. I often say when I meet with my progressive uh, party colleagues from around the world, many of whom are like me in opposition at the moment, I often say how much I long to have for the return of proper conservative politics in the UK and in many other jurisdictions, uh, because I think that respect for institutions uh, is a really important part of conservative, po the conservative part of politics. And it's a really important part for any progressives to think about too. Um, I absolutely believe that if advisors are being appointed and given executive roles, they should be scrutinized like the executive. But it doesn't mean that then you can say, well, all advisors are the same. Uh, you know, Mr. Snow is not the same as us. Uh, he's negotiating an international treaty. Um, if you in negotiate an international treaty, you should probably should be, you know, properly appointed by the government and properly scrutinised and accountable. And the same with them, um, uh, with, with Baroness Harding. And um, when I was with the New South Wales Labour Party um, and Labour in government in New South Wales, there was a, a phrase that we that we had, which I which I've treasured ever since, which is they never talked about freedom of information. They always talked about freedom from information. And I think it's in politics, it's, it's really important to understand uh, that in a lot of places there should be freedom from information. So, of course, SPADs shouldn't go to select committees. I mean, one of the many reasons sort of SPADs shouldn't go to select committees is that, is that ministers should be able to sack SPADs to get through a difficult situation, safe in the knowledge that nothing will ever be said about why that person was sacked. Um, it's omerta, not an NDA. I get that, and that's why it actually lasts. Um, but, I, but, I, but I think um the world would be better um if, if um, the world of spattery shifted back into uh the darkness and that uh, we thought more uh, uh about what is it that makes everything in the system effective the, you know the clear roles and responsibilities for the advisors for number 10 uh for the, the appointments like like dido hardings um the, the 
what is it that makes a really good department work is often not the cabinet secretary. It's a really good minister of state of which there is always, in my experience, at reshuffle time, an incredible shortage. Uh, you probably have three or four departments you want to fix and you've only got one or two people who you can move. Um, and so it's a kind of we're part of a system uh, and to be seen outside that system uh, isn't helpful or, or healthy and doesn't lead to any sensible ideas much in the way that um, I, I disagree with Peter about um, Dom Cummings and civil service reform. He had ideas about where he'd like to be in 20 years an inarticulated critique or half articulated critique of the current system and no way of getting from there from one place to the other place much like working with Frank Field on welfare reform. Um, the difficult thing is that all of us have to get us from where we really are to where we'd really like to be with loads of concessions on the way and civil service reform in this government a bit like it was in the, the, the Blair government it is a it, it's a solution looking for a problem to solve. Is Peter, you wanted to come in, but sort of picking up on some of that is, is, is the danger with that that nothing then ever changes um, or uh, we're too afraid of reform? Uh, uh, what do you think? Well, I, I think, uh, I think so. I think, oh, sorry. Go, 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 to Peter, go to Peter for Peter. Go to Peter yeah. No, John, John, go ahead. Oh, you're all too polite. <laughs> go on then, John, briefly and then Peter. No, no, just no, one. What, what, what. Redcliffe Maud was for the 19th century. We probably do need another settlement, but it needs to be as big and public a debate as that, rather than this three word slogan that roams around looking for a problem to solve. Yeah, yeah. Peter. I think there's been some really, really good points brought up by a, a number of people um, in this discussion. I think that there's a point uh, which isn't really strictly relevant, but John was talking about Dominic Cummings and sort of getting to, to a point. I think I actually agree with him in that there was an idea of where to get to, but but no idea of the process. And if there's one thing civil service, the civil service does better than any other group of people I've ever come across is process. It's knowing what is, it can sometimes be cumbersome, it can sometimes be really annoying, it can sometimes take a, a long time and get very distracted, you can get very distracted by things, but essentially the civil service know how to do things. Um, I, I was often annoyed that they could do strategy much more, much better than delivery. But essentially I went from, I worked with one uh, co-special advisor at the very start of my career in the Northern Ireland office, Lord Cain, Jonathan Cain, who I'm sure uh, people wouldn't mind, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me telling you that he, he had you know a lot of contempt for the civil service and felt that uh, it was a block, a block, um, that you know he kept. Uh, he would say things like, um, you know, the, so the, the the department is not a democracy. Um, you know, we say and, and they do, um, and that was it was probably the wrong attitude actually. Um, and more that I, the more I worked and worked with really really good civil servants, especially in the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. We had a brilliant PPS called Jamie Cowling, who worked at Number Ten. Um, I, I actually wrote a, a sort of two and a half page why Jamie is so brilliant bit, which the Cabinet Office took out of my book. Uh, rather annoyingly, but um, he was, you know, outstanding uh, person, and I think those relationships with the private office are really, really important. What Salma says as well, I agree with, in terms of this, the process, the constitutional process. I think, um, in terms of keeping uh, special advisors in the background, they should be in the background uh, as much as possible. They should not be political figures in their own right. I think Dominic Field on that uh, to a huge degree. I think Ulster Campbell Field on that um, to a degree. I think Nick and Fee did as well, um, but I mean. You know, ask even a hundred political people about who Ed Llewellyn was, or what Joey did, or Kate Fall, what they, despite her book, what they did for 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 uh, David Cameron. And most people won't know, and that's the way things should be. Um, and I think I think that's the that's the the emphasis I would put on. But no, the the interaction, as someone was talking about, just to pick up on the point with with private office, that's absolutely necessary. And I think what I would um, counsel any new Secretary of State to do or any new Special Advisor to do is get that relationship right. Sometimes that involves a change of personnel. Uh, sometimes that involves getting people you don't work with well, uh, moving them on to, to other jobs. And the great thing about the civil service is that nobody ever loses their job. So, you know, they always have a job to go to, um, unlike Special Advisors. But no, I do I do think you've got to get um, private office right. Um, I think the relationship actually with the permanent secretary I find uh, less important than the relationship with PPS that was incredibly important but also uh, the final point just to make on this one is in regard to freedom, freedom from information which I think is, is John's uh, among many 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 good points um, his best point today because when I was a journalist and I know Salma was a journalist as well I was really into freedom of information putting requests and thinking you know sunlight is the best disinfectant nonsense 
you know, the more that's done behind closed doors, the more government can get on, especially in regard to, you know, dealing with people, especially in regard to negotiations, which I was involved with in Northern Ireland, for example, the less that's in the public domain, the more you can get done and then present something as a fait accompli, because as is often the case in negotiations, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And uh, I, I, I'm very much a, a, not a fan of uh, too much scrutiny. Some scrutiny, yes, of course, oh, and oh. scrutiny after the fact, but not during. It's a brilliant <laughs> provocative point, Peter. Thank you for uh, that. Not quite the IFG line on uh, <laughs> <laughs> these things, but all to the all, all to the good on not that. Yet. Yeah. I'm pleased to see the uh, the uh, given given uh, my career history, the the importance of private office being recognised. I was I was reading before this. I was get, getting out my um, uh, Peter Hennessy Whitehall uh, book, and there was a brilliant uh, quote um, from Harold Wilson. He said he wanted his special advisers to be properly dovetailed into the administrative machine, not floating about in an irresponsible way. Um, and he didn't want eminence greases or Rasputins or court favourites. I'm not sure we can say that that, um, uh, that that Wilson quite lived up to that. But um, uh, do, you, do, do you agree, Selma? Um, yes, I think there, there's always uh, an importance to having a proper structure and a process because the problem with having, you know, the eminent squeeze or Rasputin type figure is that um, actually it does create a lot of resentment um, as, as you know, Rasputin sort of demise proved. <laughs> um, you kind of, you have, you, you, if you get picked out as a favourite as well, um, you tend to and this is just an observation rather than from experience or you know anything that's sort of um, empirical is if you if you're picked out as a favorite you tend to either think that you can get away with a lot more than you can and start sort of um, being risky and then you also think that your importance is greater than that of the ministers whether it's the minister to, that you're working to or anyone else around government and you absolutely have a lot of influence um, as a special advisor, but it should be tempered and it should be tempered by um, learning, uh, you know, really what your role is and also by the minister that is, is supposed to manage you, which is another reason why this sort of attachment and having special advisors answer to number 10 actually conversely breaks discipline down a little bit. Because if you don't feel like you, you, you know, your day to day management isn't, uh, you know, right there and you're being viewed by your minister constantly, then I think you feel um, probably uh, more able to take risks. Thanks. Emma. There's a brilliant question from Jonathan Fisher that um, relates to some of these points, but um, he asks, can we return to the old system of having special advisors with special knowledge of their department's oh. issues so as to ensure that policies are well anchored in reality no. rather than generalists that hold sway on policy development? This is a criticism that is often levelled, obviously, at the but civil the, service. That's what civil Peter, service are for. They're the Peter, policy experts. Uh, well, we're interested. Peter, you mentioned Jonathan Kane, who is well known as a Northern Ireland expert. He brought something to the Northern Ireland uh, office that, that other special advisors might not have. So dis disagreement on that. But do you think there's a role for specialist advisors, perhaps? Um, yes, but I think there are many specialist advisors in the civil service. I think there are many academics and other advisors who you can talk to. There are many industry bodies. There are stakeholders. There are, you know, advisors are, um, you know, not just special advisors, not just civil servants. Every politician will talk to all sorts of people. Um, you know, people have been very critical, in my view, very sexist in regard to their criticism of Carrie Simmons recently. You know, she is someone who who has every right to tell Boris what she thinks as his partner, as well as someone who has been a, a, a director of communications and a special advisor herself. You know, politicians listen to a lot of people, not just their special advisors um, and not just the civil service. And that's the way it should be. Um, and I think that if you want a specialist piece of work done, you can do that on a formal basis. You can bring someone in to do a study or you can get a specialist policy advisor in if you want that to be the case. Um, I mean, Jonathan Cain was someone who, you know, I, I admire very much. He's a friend um, who, you know, was someone who knew more about Northern, Northern Ireland policy than most people who are alive. Uh, certainly he spent more time negotiating with Sinn Féin than most people who are alive, apart from perhaps Jonathan Powell. Um, and, and maybe a few others, but um, you know, he, he brought a, a great level of knowledge. But what what the slight issue I think was in when you uh, he worked for six secretaries of state, he advised um, seven, but worked properly as a special advisor for six. Is that um, you know the the mark that a specific um, Secretary of State wants to put on is sometimes not the case because there's kind of a sense of continuity and I'm not really a fan of special advisors work continuing to work in the same department for different ministers. I think, you know, I, I much more like the idea of what I did myself with James Brugger, what Salma did with, with Saj, 
uh, in terms of moving around departments and being their, their eyes and ears because you know the policy you can pick up you know the policy and you, you also don't need to know everything about it because it's civil servants job to know about it um, but I think the, the instinct the political instinct I remember one uh, Ministry of Defence special advisor once saying to me you know my job isn't tanks it's politics uh, and that's what you absolutely have to remember. Um, you're there to be a political advisor, not to necessarily know everything about tanks or housing or, um, you know, place numbers or whatever. Thanks, Peter. John, very briefly, then I've got a question for Tim and then I've got a final question for all of you. So, John. It's really important to understand what special advisors do and don't do. The world is full of policy. In my view, there's far too much policy. People can stop producing policy for 20 <laughs> years and there'll still be a surplus. There's a policy mountain. Um, the world is full of people who can advise on policy. There's a smaller number than people who produce, so people produce policy and they can't give you advice. So that's a smaller pool of policy advisors. The people who there's hardly any of in the world are people who give good political policy advice. And it's the political and the good part of that that's really important. That's what we actually do. And at the core of it is you can define yourself and you have to define yourself by being the person in the department or the person at number 10 who says to your boss, no, you're not doing that. That the civil service is ultimately there to execute the wishes of the government, however nuts those wishes are. Um, and obviously ministerial direction sometimes requested, but our job is sometimes just to go, boss, you're not gonna do that. And here's the reasons you're not gonna do that. And sometimes your job is to repeatedly stop something happening until it stops happening because your boss can keep bringing the same idea up and it doesn't make it any better. And finally, it just doesn't get done. And that is your job too. So the role of saying no is really important too. And that's part of where the authority comes with. And that's also part of where the authority comes that the, that the civil service see in you, that they see you can actually be the person that puts the brake on. Lightning conductor and blocker. Really quickly, Peter. And then I want Just to really, on. really quick point. Um, I did an interview with a, um, on talk radio recently and the the uh, host didn't uh, with the greatest of respect and didn't know a huge amount about special mm -hmm. advisors or what they were or what they did and he said you know explain this relationship to me and I, I just what john was saying just reminds me and i said put it this way you know you know when you've had an argument with your wife and all your mates are saying no nah, no nah, you can't apologize shouldn't apologize and i think the talk radio audience appreciated what i said was you know the, your your special advisor is a guy who takes you down the pub has a quiet pint and says right it's time to apologize to your wife there we go. So we've had lightning conductors, we've got <laughs> relationship counsellors, we've got the people who say no. Tim, I, 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 I'm bringing you in. Uh, there's a question from Vicky Price um, about SPADs needing to be open to listening to civil servants who have the evidence about what works and what doesn't work. Um, she mention, mentions Brexit. Um, and if SPADs don't want to listen or don't convey that to the minister, then bad policies um, follow. Uh, sort of communicating and selling a policy doesn't solve the problem of bad policies. We touched on some of that, but but Tim, particularly sort of thinking about the Brexit context and some of the work that you've done, uh, mm -hmm. have you got any reflections on that? Yeah, I, I think it's a really important question. And, and as John said earlier, you know, if the substance of the policy is bad, it doesn't matter sort of how much you dress it up politically or as a, an official press officer, you know, it's always going to be a bad policy and will we'll go down badly. Um, I think there are examples, and, and Brexit is, is pertinent, you know, one of the criticisms of Nick and Fee's time in number 10 was that they were uh, gatekeepers and they did not let things get through to the Prime Minister. And so the Prime Minister was not getting the information um, that, you know, would have allowed her to make better, more informed decisions because they were taking a very sort of strong approach to what she did and didn't see. And I think that is bad that does lead to bad government if, if you know if civil servants think the prime minister you know needs to see this this is important and advisors are saying no she can't see it that's not helpful for anyone um but the converse of that is, is the point that everyone has made right you know the spads are there to bring political lens and if if you're sort of your kind of wonky technocratic civil servants say well minister this is the best thing to do mm. and spad says yep yeah, but it's not going to sell it will go down badly with the press it will lose us the next elect whatever it might be then that's essential advice for a minister to have isn't it and and there's no you know uh, civil servants get frustrated with politics because they can do the sort of impartial you know this is the, what the impact assessment says we should do and this is what the kind of uh you know expert experts say but um, in the end you know it comes down to the politics because that's how government works and and if you didn't have that then i think you'd also get a lot of bad policies thanks tim now we've got one minute left 
Um, uh, we've talked about uh, where next for special advisors sort of as a class and in government. What about where next for individual special advisors? We've got three former special advisors on the panel. What does a special advisor do when they leave office? Uh, three uh, brilliant examples here, but Salma, what next after being a special advisor? Oh, um, well, you go down the tried and tested route of becoming a consultant. And then um, if you're really, really attached to Westminster, you then go and try your hand at becoming a politician. So it's become a bit of a sector, I'm afraid. Um, or, you know, maybe write a book uh, or go into academia or do or do something policy related and think tanky. But um, most special advisors uh, that I know, and uh, this is probably true for me as well, is that we don't really stray far from the Westminster village in, in some form or another. Or even if we do, in John's case, you know, we go to the other side of the world and do the same thing. Um, <laughs> so you, you, I think you end up being a political beast. It's not like you uh, leave government and then all of a sudden you decide that you're going to go work on an oil rig. Uh, you actually, there's always going to be some tangential connection and, uh, you know, without wanting to sound um, too cynical about it, you know, there is value in the, in what you've learned. And so being able to share some of that expertise, um, you know, commercially or uh, in terms of think tanks and policy, um, there, that is normally where you go. So you don't stray too far away. Peter, surely nobody would write a book about this. No, definitely not. Definitely not. Um, <laughs> politics is addictive and there is no known cure. Um, it, as Salma correctly says, that is that is uh, certainly there. I personally wouldn't stand as an MP. I can't think of any worse job I've seen the sacrifices people make. Uh, I've seen the scrutiny people come under. However, uh, she didn't quite say it, but if Salma were ever to stand for office, I'd be there on day one volunteering to post a few leaflets through letterboxes for you, Salma. <laughs> There we go. And John, finally, what 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 is the special advisor? Look, I, I always say to people who are wondering whether they should take the job uh, as an advisor or not. For, the first thing I say is, um, don't believe a single promise that the politician makes to you about how they look after you after you do the job. They mean it when they say it to you. They forget about it as soon as they leave the room. That's part of the nature of the relationship. You've got to know your own exit plan, your own exit strategy. Which leads me to my second piece of advice to people, which is look after your networks and then yep. your networks will look after you. And if you don't look after your networks, then you're in your problem. And then at the end of it all, it comes out, there are some special advisors for whom the time in government is the political part of their lives. And there's other advisors, and we're on, as we discussed it here, there's people for whom politics you know, is their life and a political life of some sort is what you have and you're in and out. And the advice to people in the second category for whom you still remain part of the political is, your job now is not to do backseat driving for the current generation. You can be incredibly helpful to your own party and people coming through the party. As long as you reflect people, this is how it was for me. This is what happened to us. You don't say the only way to do it is this. And you see and you see that uh, there are too many backseat drivers amongst former special advisors and far too few coaches and mentors. Uh, in 10 seconds, Alex, I just want to agree with John uh, completely and say, talk about networks, keep in touch with the people from home, keep in touch with the people who have no interest in politics, talk to them as much as possible because you'll just be so much better at your job. Brilliant. Thank you all. Uh, and we had a little advisory section for current and former special advisors <laughs> as well. So never let it be said that we don't provide a, a service uh, here at the Institute for Government. Um, thank you to uh, Salma, Peter, John and Tim for being such a brilliant um, panel. Thank you to you all for uh, watching and listening. Thanks for the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through more of them, but they were really, really good questions. Um, do keep uh, an eye out for IFG Live events and podcasts. We've got loads and loads of stuff on the website and on the feeds wherever you get your um, podcasts from. Thank you all for watching and have a very good rest of the day. <laughs>